The Science of Sports podcast with Professor Ross Tucker and sports journalist Mike Finch. Revealing the truth behind the games we play. Coming up in this episode. This is the one where the disconnect between the academic world and the end user is probably the largest. 41 years of research progress ends up being, just pick what's comfortable. You know, we're we're selling the same shoe now in 2019 that we were selling in about 1978. The notion that a shoe can prevent injury is flawed. Antipronation devices, cushioning, seamless uppers, decoupled heels, EVA foam and even energy return. The technology behind running shoes continues to baffle and evolve all at the same time. But is it science or just good marketing? My name is Mike Finch, along with uh, Professor Ross Tucker. Welcome, Ross. I know you've been travelling a bit overseas and uh, you've been having some interesting times with some other sports other than running. We won't get into that right now. But uh, today we're talking about a very complex subject. And I know for those of you who have been uh, following us um, on the Science of Sport podcast for the first three editions, we've been very heavily involved in the Cassis and Mini issues. So today we're talking about something a little bit lighter. I'm talking about light, about 250 grams of lightness in terms of the average running shoe weight. Um, and we're going to be talking about shoe signs. And the reason why we're talking about it is, is because... It's a, it's a subject very close to my heart. I've been the editor of Runner's World magazine here in South Africa for um, almost 20 years. And one thing that I've never been able to kind of answer to the people that ask me this question is, what shoe should I buy? Everybody comes to me and says, what shoe should I buy? And the reason why I find it very difficult is that because over the years, we've seen so many different technologies. We've seen all these weird antiponation devices, cushioning, all that sort of thing. And it's very difficult to say how many of those devices actually work. Do they help the runner? Do they prevent injuries? Do they do all the things that they say that they do? And I think that's the reason why we're doing this podcast today is to try and get a sense of what is real in technology and shoes, what is unreal, what is just good marketing, and what your next purchase should potentially look like. And I know, Ross, we were speaking a little bit before we started the podcast today and saying that, again, it is a very complex issue, isn't it? Yeah, I haven't been involved in every aspect or facet of sports science and medicine, obviously, but of the half a dozen that I have stuck a finger or a toe into this is the one a toe in this case yeah (laughs) yeah more than a toe in this instance (laughs) a whole foot so what happened was in 2008 i went to the u.s and that was more or less at the time that the barefoot running thing was growing in publicity and a friend of mine was just finishing up his honors degree and he was quite interested in a phd so we ended up doing he ended up doing a phd on barefoot running And that was when I got stuck into the biomechanics of running shoes and running injuries. And honestly, of all the, as I was saying, of all the areas of sports science, this is the one where the disconnect between the academic world and the end user is probably the largest. Like there's no, there's no straight line that tells the, because the end user is the runner. Yeah. Or even one degree removed is the practitioner, the physio, the podiatrist, the salesperson in the shop. And then when you read the academic literature, it just, it just never commits to anything. And when it does, it contradicts what was said before. So it's this vortex of academic literature done often by engineers, not clinicians. Mm. The, the perceived uh, and comfort it often filter is the logical outcome. And of people studies, join the dots so that vanilla. they can see. And so some make triangles and some make squares and some make circles. And in the end, the guy who actually needs the shoe is sitting there going, what should I wear here? Now, we could simplify all this and conclude this podcast in the next 30 seconds by telling you, <laughs> Uh, you should try out a different range of options, and when you find something comfortable that works for you, stay with it. Yeah. Because for all the research, for all the thousands of papers and the hundreds of thousands of words, that's still where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we don't want to be that vanilla. So the no. purpose of this podcast is to dissect why certain things are thought, where they may be incorrect, where they may be I correct, so that you can make at least an informed guess as opposed to a total one guess. Fetches for you. So my experience with running shoes, I'm 95 kilos, 1.9 meters, nine meters tall so fairly tall and if i went into running shop a few years ago what they would do is they would say my goodness you pronate very very badly we're going to put you in a motion control shoe motion control shoes i remember there was the brooks beast which in the united states was the biggest selling shoe for many many years and we've seen a very sort of interesting development in the way that shoes have gone over the years and that we've moved away from motion control shoes but stability shoes are still in there we've had the barefoot brigade that have come through and of course neutral shoes have always retained you know some level of market share but 
you know, they, they often it's almost humorous going into a bike shop, uh, into into a, a shoe shop here, and looking at what people when they look at me, they say, "Well, goodness, you you're definitely a big guy, give you maximum cushioning." But actually, the shoes that I run in, the most uncomfortable the shoes I am, I run in are racing flats, and they go against everything that I've ever heard about running. And probably the shoe guy at the shoe shop would say that there's no way you can run in a shoe like that. So. That's where it sits with me, is that the most comfortable shoe for me is the shoe that is probably the, the shoe that is going to be the least prescribed by a shoe salesman. Yeah, and I think a few things are in play. Obviously, there's marketing pressure is one of them. Yeah. And when we talk about the science going back 40 odd years and how the marketing and the commercial landscape changed in parallel with the science, you'll see how those two things are often indistinguishable from one another, marketing and tech. <laughs> But then the other thing is that runners don't get precious about their t-shirts and their caps and their socks. But the shoe is, it's basically the one piece of equipment mm. you commit to when you decide you're going to run a marathon or a 10k. Yeah. And so... It's the hardware. Yeah. So not unsurprisingly, it is the focal point of discussion for, for runners, right? Then what's happened is that the shoe has received disproportionate blame or credit, depending on which side of the fence you sit, for <laughs> injuries and performance. And on the injury side, the shoe is prescribed as if it's medicine. So in other yeah. words, the salesperson is saying, that here comes a person who needs the following shoe, and it's going to prevent or treat what is basically a medical condition, because you're injured, yeah. or you don't want to get injured. But when you think about medicines, you, you're thinking about drugs that have undergone randomized control trials over many years to test them, they know exactly what dosage, who should use it, when they should use it, how much they should use, what the side effects might be, and what the contraindications are. There is nothing like that for shoes. There's a collection of hundreds of studies, which tend to be quite small in size because they're very difficult to do. So you very rarely get these massive scale studies like you would for drug trials. Yeah. And they measure these complex interactions. So when someone gets a knee injury, there could literally be dozens of things contributing to that. And the end result is that two people, Mike and Keith, could be identical in every measurable respect. In other words, as a scientist, I can't tell you apart. Yeah. You're in the same shoe, you get injured, and he doesn't. Yeah. And I wouldn't know why. And that's what we're trying to kind of discover today. Is <laughs> By the much, same, yeah. yeah, exactly. By the same token, Mike and John mm. could be completely different in every measurable respect, pronation, impact forces, landing pattern, whatever. You're running in the same shoe, and neither of you is injured, or both are. Mm. And so... The point that I'm trying to make is that our, our ability to predict injury and then to also work backwards from injury and explain it is much more limited than people might think when it comes to shoes. It reminds me a bit of a Monty Python skit where there's a scene in the square where the guy says, you're all individuals, and somebody at the back says, I'm not. And I think when it comes to shoe technology, we are all ind individuals. We're, we're one of those, we are everybody's different. You and I run very differently and uh, we've all got different biomechanics and I think that's where it becomes very complex because one shoe f doesn't fit all at all. It's no. almost impossible that it can. Yeah, and that's kind of the vanilla conclusion that often is reached in these, mm. in these studies. And I remember, this guy's name will come up a lot, one of the great biomechanics researchers is a guy called Ben O'Neill. He's this big bear-like man who's, I think initially from Germany or Switzerland, apologies if I get that wrong, but he's been based up in Canada for many years until his recent retirement. And he gave a keynote talk in Monaco a few years ago at the medical convention, almost as a swan song. Mm. And after an hour, he basically concluded, it depends. <laughs> so you sit there and you say, well, I've listened to this for an hour and he's told me it depends. And that's, that's what I was getting at earlier. Is like you'll read 4,000 words in a scientific journal and yeah. your head will spin and the conclusion is might or maybe. Yeah. And, so, and that's good science in a sense. But the shoe companies aren't selling maybes. Yeah. They're selling you definitive solutions yeah. to your problem. And that's where the tension exists between the research mm. and, the, and the marketing aspect of it. Well, there's so many questions I've got, and we're going to get onto these different marketing pressures that a lot of these shoe brands feel. But let's, uh, let's go back to the start. The history of running shoe tech. Uh, it all started back in sort of the 1920s with uh, Onitsuka Tiger and Adolf Dassler, the, the founder of Adidas, and of course, the famous story of Bill Bauman in 1971, where he poured rubber into his wife's waffle iron and produced suddenly this amazing running shoe. But that's, that was the sort of origins of athletic shoes. But Ross, when, when did it kind of become about technology and pronation and this, this idea that if you were more cushioned and you could control your pronation, suddenly you were going to be less injured and potentially even a better runner? Yeah, so the, f 
people have to understand where running has come from. So people have obviously run for hundreds of years. The Olympics, 1896, was the modern Olympic Games. But running as a thing didn't exist until the 1970s. Um, so there were marathons, of course. Boston and so forth are easily 100 years old. Yeah. But they would attract 500 to 1,000 people. And there were very few people doing recreational running. Um, and then what happened in the 1970s is for a number of reasons, the popularity of running just absolutely explodes. And within five years, you go to these five, 10,000 people races. Now, that obviously creates a market. And then you get joggers. Yeah, so that was... <laughs> the jogging seen, revolution of the early seen, 70s. Uh, was it Anchorman? Or where? Anchorman, yes. Yo- yo- I think it's a soft jam, Mike. It's jogging. It's jogging. jogging. <laughs> so, so that actually tells the story of <laughs> where this begins. But this now is about you've... science, by the way, not about movies. <laughs> <laughs> so now you've got uh, joggers, but what that does is it sets up a market, so now you yeah. can sell into it, but it also creates an injury epidemic. The, the because before doctors were seeing 10 people a year, studies, now they're seeing 100. It's so vanilla. And now there's, now there's a problem. So what's the solution? So, so doctors start saying, well, why are we seeing these injuries? Can we, can we help prevent these injuries? And in 1978, a, a really interesting, fascinating paper actually gets published in the journal, uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine by James Bates and Osternig. And this was called Injuries to Runners. And it's the first published paper that I can see that introduces the term excessive pronation. Because basically what he does, he, he runs a clinic out of Eugene, Oregon, which ends up obviously being Nike Town. Um, and how he, coincidental. He, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how we link that in history. Yeah. But, but he basically looks at the lower limb alignment of all the injured runners who come in there. So we're talking ankle and so forth. And this relates to pronation. So without getting okay, technical... Well, let's, let's just quickly define what is pronation. For those who don't know what pronation is, what is how do you define pronation simply? Okay, we'll do it simply because it doesn't yeah. lend itself to listening on a pod. But it's the it's the movement around the ankle during the running stride, and it, it's by, strictly speaking, it's mostly the e version around the ankle. So it's where you roll from the outside in yeah. during the stride. It's so the way your foot rolls, and it comes from the outside, and it kind of rolls inward yeah. as you take off and land. Yeah, biomechanists okay. are cringing as they listen to us simplified yeah. in that way. But yeah. that's basically what it is, and and and. From the perspective of the consumer, that's that's it. It's 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 a lot more. It's yeah. the simultaneous rotation, inversion, dorsiflexion, plant. Anyway, but all that yeah. science stuff. Yeah. So in other words, neutral runners, and I'm again, okay, I'm simplifying, would be less likely to roll over them their foot, and people who pronate more would roll more over their foot when they when they pronate. So you get levels of pronation within within each individual. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, exactly. So studies would classify you as a supernator, which means you don't roll at all. Yeah. As opposed to Those neutral, are very rare, is, though. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to neutral, which is generally the most common, mm. and then degrees of pronation. Right. So Okay, so now we understand what pronation is, and then we get so, to the point of excessive pronation. So James introduces this concept, which then becomes embedded in the language of marketing materials and shoes and so forth for decades. I mean, it's unless you've got good years, reason yeah. to yeah. think paper. otherwise. Comes out. And what he describes is how... 58% of the runners he sees in his clinic are pronators. He describes that in, I think it was 17 of them who were extreme cases, they were given orthotics. And what an orthotic is doing generally in this case is trying to limit or control either the speed or the degree of that pronation. And he yeah. says that in 81% of those cases, the injury was uh, solved, the injury problem. And so he ends up writing this very s- important sentence in his paper. He talks about what can be used to prevent the injury, and he he focuses a lot, actually, on rest and reduced mileage. He recognizes the training errors of the problem. But if I just read this for you here, he talks about the running shoe, and he says, Unfortunately, none of the shoes currently on the market fulfill all of the essential characteristics of a good training shoe. And so he joins the dots between injured runners, pronators, excessive pronators, orthotics work, shoes might help. And that probably at some point gives birth to the idea that a shoe can do the job of an orthotic and that if we limit that motion, we'll prevent the injury. That's near as I can tell, that's where it all begins. All right. So is that bit of research credible in this day and age? Is it something that we can say, well, that, that, is, a, that is a shift in the way that people saw pronation? I mean, is it, is it right? 
Uh, it may be, may, it depends. <laughs> I'm going to use a lot in this Ben uh, conclusion from a lifetime of biomechanics research, is yeah. my answer. Uh, it, you must remember that James isn't doing a, what's the best type of study, which is a prospective study where you can measure how athletes or runners' biomechanics operate, their limb alignment and so forth, and then see who gets injured. He's, he's doing it in retrospect. He's got yeah. his collection of injuries, and then he's trying to link what he sees to what he might, what might have caused it. So that's, right. that's scientifically, that's weak. Yeah. But so it wasn't time, a strong study. No, it's but an it was a good one at the time. It's an association study, and it's a study, and this, this is the problem with all these biomechanics, not all, but most of them, is that when you have an intervention like introducing orthotic, that, that very rarely is the only thing you change. You might also change the training, give the athlete some strength, some flexibility. I don't know what the clinician might do. Yeah. But the package of things then works. Now you've got to say which one did it. Yeah. And so that's, that's probably the criticism of this. When you do a hindsight, in hindsight, 2020 vision study, we've linked pronation to that. And there were, there were a number of other studies that then reinforced his finding. But by the 1990s, the study started coming out showing that there was no association. So then the, then the pendulum starts moving back the other way. So I think, I think the James study nudges it this way, and then the shoe companies responded because... Nudging it towards the fact that pronation is the cause of injury. Not just pronation, also, also impact forces. Okay. So in his, paper, as well. in his paper, he talks about running on soft surfaces would reduce the risk of injury because hard surfaces and impact cause injuries. Mm -hmm. So that's model number one. And model number two is that excessive pronation causes injury. So that, that, those two things become the foundation of running shoes and injury prevention yeah. is we need soft motion control. Yeah. And if you look at shoes prior to the mid-1970s, late 1970s, they look like the, not minimalist shoe, but they look like the lightweight shoe of today. They yeah. have hardly anything on them. They were called plimsolls, weren't they? Yeah, so this isn't a 1970 shoe. But we're, this showing is, this on, this not, we're showing this on Facebook Live, but um, Ross is kind yeah. of showing a pair of Adidas Adizeros, which are probably the lightest, fastest shoes, we're, one of the many fast shoes on the market. Yeah, it's the lightest one I think they, they make for the mass population. Yeah. And you can see that the, the underneath the heel you have maybe 15 millimeters to 20 millimeters of cushioning. If you ever look at what shoes then look like, within five years, that heel thickness doubles because the focus is on softness. Yeah. And then normally what happens is on the inside, what they call the medial side of the shoe, so that's where your arches are, they would also use different materials and put what I remember one called a roll bar, uh, and they'd come up with all sorts of names. And those things were designed to try and stop the movement inward. So, right. So these two devices, soft cushion and motion control, become the staple of the running shoe industry until probably the 1990s. And at that point, enough research starts coming in to challenge the paradigm. People start a doing bigger studies no frame of with better control. And they the start saying, the actually, shoe as a we can't find this association. The people who pronate are no more likely to be the injured than the people who are, are classified as neutral. Why do you think those studies happen? Is because people weren't getting less injured? Yeah, so you mean why did, why did they continue to do the research? Why, yeah, why not just accept that that's what that study back in 1978 said by James and then suddenly they have to now challenge it. Why does science challenge those things? What, what's the motivation behind challenging something like that, which seems the, yeah, obvious? It, okay, I understand that. And you're yeah. right. It's because the problem persisted. Yeah. <clears throat> so the solution was offered in the form of the shoe, the cushioning, so the, the motion control, the form, and then the problem didn't go away. The, the problem so being that runners that, were That a large, injured. large proportion of runners would be injured. And so it depended. This, this also varies enormously by study, but between 20% and 70% of runners get injured a year. Now, yeah. it depends on how you define an injury. Is it my foot is Probably sore, so I'm going to take a day off? Or is it I needed a week off? Or did I need to go see a doctor for treatment and miss a month? So it depends. And most, uh, most clinicians will say that anything that stops you running for a week would be defined as a significant injury, not just a niggle. Yeah, that's, an, that that's, an, that's a clean way to create an objective cutoff. Right. So this is like when you imagine you had a hall of a thousand people sitting next to one another. The guy in the front will say, look to your left, look to your right. At least two of you will be injured in the next two years. That's, yeah. and so that's the problem. So you've got this Unless you've got beneficial activity, running or jogging, into a neutral and uh, 
and two out of three people every couple of years are injured. Yeah. And, and we'll shoot- get to why our theories and our hypotheses around why you get injured a bit later on. So I know yeah. people are saying, well, why do people get injured? But we will get onto that, but carry right. on. So shoes are off. So that's the problem. Yeah. Shoes are the solution. But hey, the problem doesn't go away. And so the research continues. Now, the, the failure of shoes to solve the injury problem was a key failure element of, of the barefoot running the movement's argument. Was yeah. They the basically said, well, it proves the, the shoe is useless. I don't argument. think that's true either because when there were 500 people lining up at a marathon, those 500 people were serious runners. Yeah. Their average mass was 70 kilograms for men. The average finishing time was like three hours 20 or something, which is super quick now. And with the explosion of running, what happened is that people who, and I'm not being unkind to say this, people who probably shouldn't be running are suddenly running, which is terrific. Yeah. But now you're getting a guy who's been a desk jockey, couch potato for 10 years. Mm. He weighs 90 to 100 kilograms. He's not familiar with exercise and activity and fitness and health. Mm. And he's suddenly doing 30K a week. It's like Will Ferrell, really. <laughs> exactly. So it's Will Ferrell in the movie. Now, the, the point is that, that 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 person is probably an extremely high-risk person. So when the overall injury rate stays the same, I would argue that that's probably a win. Yeah. Uh, because the 500 who ran before never got, hardly ever got injured, and yeah. it's the next 4,500 who 90% of them will get injured, but it's only 70. So, so, so I suspect that shoes do offer some benefit, the trick now is to figure out who belongs in which shoe. So we move on. So the, the, these all these studies now that are kind of not contradicting each other, but it's a development of science in this respect, isn't it, in many respects? Yes, and this is typical of research. You'll get a study that finds X, and then another study finds Y, and then another f- study finds X plus Y, and then another study will find Z and disprove X and Y. And that, that, especially when it comes to biomechanics, because it's so complex, this tends to happen a lot. So things like controlling the status of the athlete you're testing. So a novice runner who's been running for less than six months is probably injured for different reasons compared to someone who's run for six years. Yeah. Uh, heavier people are more likely to be injured than lighter people, so you've got to control that. Men versus women, the surface they run on the mm. types of training that are done, the sample size, the measurement techniques and tools used. So you take your pick. I mean, there's so many reasons why mm. studies contradict one another, but the point is they do. Mm. The, the problem was that people were holding on to models. And so very early on, when it, for, for instance, when we talk about impact causing injury, it split into two schools of thought. The one was that it was the initial impact on landing and the rate at which you loaded your body that caused the impact, uh, the injury. Mm-hmm. And the other one was that it was the peak force, which happens later on during your stride as your body moves over your foot yeah. that caused the injury. And so some people then chose their enemy, as it were, the injury-causing factor, and they pursue that, and other people yeah. go the other way. And so you get divergent research theories and so forth. And in the end, it leaves, as we said, the consumer... Yeah. spinning a little bit. And one of the things that I, I mean, it's a personal bugbear of mine is when uh, shoe manufacturers kind of claim research that has been done by themselves or been commissioned by themselves. And I think that's one element that it's a little bit like the, the story of the Gatorade Hydration Clinic, where for many years Gatorade sponsored research around hydration. And there was always question marks as to whether that, that research was correct because Gatorade was investing in no making people you, drink more. And I think the same, the same applies to shoes to some extent in that uh, you want to try and prove that the technology that you're going to be promoting out in the market is beneficial to the runner. And I'm, I guess in many ways there is always going to be some bit of science that is going to help you prove that, whether it is independent or not, to give you some basis to market your shoe or your technology. Yeah, and if we go all the way back to the 70s, I reckon people were well-intentioned. Like yeah. When you look at James, I'm not saying that James in 1978 wrote a piece thinking that he was going to bankroll a, uh, an empire of running shoes. Yeah, he, he was well-intentioned, but then pretty soon I think people pick up on it and say, you know what, if we can, if we can shift the conversation in this direction, we can win a portion of the market and that's worth this many million dollars and so forth. And the, <laughs> the clearest an place that happened no was when barefoot reference. running he buys himself became the Vogue yeah. in about 2008 9 because you couldn't sell nothing. Yeah. And so then you got barefoot shoes and yeah. it was the growth of the barefoot shoe. And I, I found stats on it. Like it went from 
yeah, less than one percent of the market. It grew by three hundred percent within yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, Everybody was running in Vibram bare f- uh, five fingers, which we've got a pair of these here at the moment. Yeah. 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 See, if I are watching yeah. us on Facebook Live, uh, we've got a pair of these Vibram shoes, which are, I'm sure many of you who f- follow running will know what these shoes look like. They're basically like, uh, they look like a pair of feet, um, just with rubber bits around them and extremely minimalist. And uh, they certainly do, uh, uh, they were the, kind of the drivers behind the minimalist uh, section of the, this uh, of this community and very much designed for barefoot. I, I tried a few of them on and I always find them very difficult to put on, especially if you had wet feet. And if you ran on the trails, they were quite nasty if you caught yourself landing on um, some rocky terrain. So they weren't the easiest to run in, but they w- they did feel... You know, I mean, we get on to barefoot just now, but it, it did feel kind of weirdly good. <laughs> yeah, so this, so this, well, not this pair, but this one was one of a pair that was actually given to me by a researcher from Harvard called Dan Lieberman. And Lieberman did maybe the famous study that triggered the barefoot running movement. It was a study that was published in Nature, and he showed that when you run barefoot and land on the front of your foot, then this this initial impact peak is much lower, and your loading rate is substantially lower and that really was petrol on fire for the barefoot running movement. So in other words he, you're becoming less of a heel striker and more of a forefoot runner. Yeah and that was in in, in true um, sort of running style you want to be more of a forefoot runner than you want to be a heel striker from an efficiency point of view. <laughs> so they say. In theory. But, but even there. <laughs> That's what I heard. Well the answer to that is it depends. Yeah. Um, so even there studies have been done of elite races and recreational runners where 70% of people are heel strikers, even at the elite level. And only yeah. 2%, so one half marathon in Japan was, was looked at, and even at the very front of the race, you're talking single digit percentage for four foot strikers. So a true four foot strike is actually quite rare um, when you're running in shoes. Yeah, Lieberman found that you do it when you're barefoot, and that triggered the the, the barefoot running movements and Vibram became a big partner. In the end, Vibram, I don't know if they, they do still exist. Yeah. But they ended up settling a $3.75 million lawsuit because they were found to have made false claims about what the shoe does. So yeah. their claim was that it would strengthen the muscles of the foot and prevent injury. And that was then eventually disproven. And they had to set aside money to refund anyone who wanted to give the shoe back. So I could have exchanged that for the $60 or whatever that it would have cost. Coming up. The media joins the dots and then says, therefore, the expense is worse. That's the bit that is taking the science too far. Yes, so your body is intelligent. So let's just move to the cushioning debate. Um, let's just kind of distill what we've been saying so far. So we've gone through a whole bunch of research. We're looking at different things around um, the, the, the pronation versus cushioning, lots of things happening. Um, let's look at some more of these studies. Where did the cushioning debate move to from the times of Stan James in 1978 right through to where we are now? I mean, summarizing 30 years, <laughs> a lot yeah. has happened. Yeah, so the pendulum has swung twice, uh, mm. broadly speaking. The first was from not really needing cushioning. James initiated what I think a lot of people were thinking, because it makes such logical sense, right, is that if you run on hard concrete surfaces and tarmac, then your risk of injury is higher because the injury is caused by the impact. And so the shift is, right, let's put people in softer and softer shoes because that will alleviate the injury risk. And so then you get these building up of the heel, it's called the stack height, is at the back, you know, the cushioning, you get air, you get gel, you get boost, you get all kinds of advancements in EVA to soften the landing. The problem here, just like with motion control, is that studies try and fail to link the impact force or the loading rate to injury. And so there are some studies that find that runners who land with more force or a greater force of a rate of force application are more likely to be injured. So, for instance, there's a woman called Irene Davis, also an extremely well-known biomechanics researcher. She does a study in women runners where she finds that if you come to her with a stress fracture in your shins, tibial stress fracture, yep. your loading rates are much higher than the people who don't have stress fractures. And she reckons with about 70% accuracy, she can predict if you're going to get a stress fracture or not based on your loading rate. But then 
as is typical here, other studies come along and they find that there's no difference, no impact made by, sorry, no influence of impact rates, uh, impact loading rates or impact forces. Yeah. So in the end, it leaves us a little bit in a scientific state of, I don't know, purgatory because we don't really know which way to go. So in other words, you don't know whether cushioning does benefit or cushioning doesn't benefit. Yeah, exactly. And, and then studies come along and they show that when you run in highly cushioned shoes, your loading rate might be higher than when you run in less cushioned shoes. Studies come along showing that when you run in highly cushioned shoes or on very soft surfaces, you land more on the heel. When you run on harder surfaces, you land more midfoot, more towards the front of the foot. And so the interaction between how you land and the cushioning under your shoe changes the forces. And so then people again, and it's the same game of join the dots, is I'm going to join a dot between the cushioning, the way you land, and your force, and we say now you're more likely to get injured. Yeah. And as recently there was a study in 2016, uh, I think Hannah Rice was the name of the author, forgive me if I get that wrong, but she basically looks at a bunch of athletes who run in very soft, expensive, top-of-the-range shoes as opposed to bottom-of-the-range yeah. and finds that the impact forces are higher in the softer shoes. The media jumps all over this and says, well, higher impact force predicts injury. Well, that's not really true. There are as many studies showing no link as there are showing this link. So the media makes out that this is now the big factor, but the science is far from sure of that. So what she was essentially saying through that research was that Cheap shoes are no worse than expensive shoes. I mean, are we, are we summarizing that correctly? That that was the hypothesis. Well, that was that was the media. Uh, that was the media take out. Yeah, you wouldn't have seen that language in a scientific paper. Yeah, a scientific paper would have limited itself. You know, we're, we're selling the same to shoe saying now, that we found that the impact we loading rate in about nineteen is higher in the softer cushion shoe, the more cushion shoe and that this has previously been linked to some running injuries. It would be circumspect, but the media is not worried about that. They no. straight in there saying, and I remember the headlines were, research suggests save your money, buy cheaper shoes. Yeah. Well, no, because no one has ever linked the predictive value, which is the force or the loading rate, to the outcome, the which is the injury. So whilst logical, it didn't flawed. really make so It's not really logical to me. I'll have to explain that a bit works. better for me. So in other words, if they're saying that this is the research says that, um, just kind of put that into layman's terms. In other words, if you're running in a shoe that is costing $100 versus a shoe that's costing $50, um, you are, you're not benefiting by, by what? The cheaper shoe means that you are... If you buy a more expensive shoe, how are you benefiting from a more beneficial, a more expensive shoe, or are you at all? Well, so so the model in this particular study um, was that when you ran in the most expensive shoe, yeah, then you landed more severely on the heel. The result was that the rate at which you loaded your skeleton or your joints on landing was higher. Yeah, and then the next step is the one that's inferred. Therefore, you will have higher injury rates. Because so in other people, words, the more expensive shoe is masking the effect of the impact. No, the other way around. Is not masking the effect of the impact. Right, because... So, so let me tell you about another study that they did barefoot. They make these athletes run over different surfaces. One of them is soft, one of them is hard. When you run on a soft surface, do you think you land more on the heel or the front of the foot? I would say the front of the foot. Compared to hard? Compared to hard, yes. No. Hard, you would land... Actually, no, the other way around. Other, the other way right, around. other way around. So in other right. words, your body, would, your body would know you're running on a hard surface and therefore it would then make you more shock absorbent. Exactly. So what happens is your body's able to sense what it's landing on. And when we run on a softer surface, our body allows us to land on the heel. Whereas when we land on a hard surface, our body adjusts our mechanics, what are called kinematics, our angles and the position of our limbs, so that we land more on the front of the heel. This is the same thing that happens when you take your shoes off and you run barefoot, is most runners shift more towards the front of the foot. They don't necessarily do forefoot landings, yeah. but they land more in the middle. It's the same thing as if you jump off a table or the ceiling, you land with bent knees. This, that's kind of like a simple analogy, right? So, so what the study finds is that when you, land, when you run in the most expensive shoe, your loading rates are higher because your body's not doing anything to compensate yeah. for the landing because it's got a soft cushion that's doing that job. Right. The media joins the dots 
and then says, therefore, the expensive shoe is worse. Right. That's the bit that is taking the science too far. The media... And the shoe company might do the, the same thing. That's what the barefoot says, running companies did, right? The expensive yeah. shoe yeah. is worse. So in other words, if you're, if you're running in a more expensive running shoe, the science too you far. are then using technology to reduce the impact through your body and through your legs and through your skeleton, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to your body doing it naturally. Yes, so your body is intelligent, is what it's saying. It's not a ball that's dropped and gravity is the only thing that influences how hard it lands. Your body is able to control the forces and the angles and the tissue vibrations. So this is a theory that's more recent by, by our friend Ben Oneg called muscle tuning, where he's basically saying that in the 100 milliseconds or so yes, before you so hit the your ground, body is your body is intelligent enough that it anticipates what you're about to land on. Is it a hard surface? Is it a soft surface? Is it a big cushion or is it a minimalist shoe that's got little or little to no cushioning? Right. And depending on what it anticipates, it changes the muscle activation. And the consequence of changing the muscle activation is that the stiffness of the leg is either lower or higher. The tissue vibration when you land is lower or higher. And his theory is that the tissue vibration is what the body is trying to protect. So the end result of this is that you've got this intelligent system that the shoe can only do so much to deceive. Yeah. So when you put a runner in a very soft shoe, they land a certain way with a certain muscle activation. A study was published last year looking at these maxed cushion shoes by Hoka. We've yeah. got now this is the this is the Spice Girl shoe, right? This is the f four centimeter thick yeah. insole, uh, outsole. Yeah. Um, and it's what the opposite of the Vibram, in other words, it's yeah. the maximum. They were famous for making so, it massively, along with Ultra, the big cushion shoes. So that's the swing of the pendulum the yeah. other way again. Yeah. And what this study found was that the impact forces and the loading rate was higher when you run with the most cushioned shoe. Right. Now, again, the media was all over this. Because your body knows that the shoe is more cushioned, therefore it can load it more. Right. And so what right. they found to explain this is that when you run in this very soft cushioned shoe, your leg stiffness is actually higher when you land. Right. So your body allows your leg to be stiffer. Right. It's not as compressed. So they measure something called leg compression. How much does your leg compress as you land, at the knee mostly, and they find that it is reduced when you run on a very soft shoe. So the, the point is that everything's interconnected is m mm. maybe the best way to simplify this for the listener. And so when you change something at the end, i.e. the shoe and the cushion you know, which you're landing selling on, the same shoe then now it might have implications for we what the knee and the hip and so forth do, the end result being that actually eight. very little changes. So. The, the, the point is that we are not simply objects that fall from space and then bounce on the ground again and again and again. There's actually some intelligence in the way that our muscles are activated and how we land on the, on the shoe and so forth. And we sense what we're about to land on. So when he gave his talk at, in Monaco, the Ben and Nick tells the story about he was working the, with sword. Cirque du Soleil so because they'd had this real increase in lower limb injuries in their, in their circus artists. And what they'd done was that they'd, they'd thought this surface that they were running on was too hard. Mm. And so they'd made a softer surface with regularly spaced beams in between the soft surface because you need the beams for support. So what happens now is someone's running on it is running beam, soft, beam, soft. So it's hard, soft, hard, soft. And Benno went to them and said, get rid of the beams and just make the whole thing hard. Yeah. And turns out, according to him, the way he tells it is the injuries go away. Because you're better off running on a known hard surface than a variable hard soft that you can't anticipate, right? right. So the, the hardness of the surface, the degree of cushioning in the shoe probably has less impact than the theory suggests because the body changes in response to it, right? Does that make sense? So it's, yeah. intuitively we think of it as like if I'm going to punch you, you'd rather I was wearing a glove. Yeah. But that's not what's happening when we run because we're, we're not punching the ground. We're actually applying the foot to the ground and there's muscle activation in anticipation and during. And these things all regulate what happens to the body. And that, in the end, probably minimizes how helpful the cushioning actually could be. Still to come. Shoe conditions that are more comfortable are associated with lower 
movement related injury frequency. The notion that a shoe can prevent an injury is flawed. So if we have a look at all the modern shoes, and I think the trend over the last couple of years has been to these massively stacked, uh, big uh, heel counters and uh, lots of foam and uh, you know max maximum support. And I think one of the interesting things, and I remember speaking to, I won't say which brand it was, but speaking to one of the marketing managers of a well-known running shoe brand a few years ago, and they were saying that the key to success as a running shoe brand is at the point of sale. So in other words, when you walk into a shoe shop and you put a shoe on, how does that shoe feel in that 20 or 30 meters that you might walk or run on their indoor track or something along that sort of line? Because that will then they will then decide whether they're going to buy the shoe from then on. So it doesn't matter how the shoe performs potentially over 10K because you're not running in a 10K. It's how that shoe performs in that shoe shop when you first put it on, which you know brands like Nike and Adidas have focused very much on that. So when you put those shoes on in the shop, they feel great. Um, and therefore, if it feels great, you are going to buy that shoe because it feels better than a shoe that feels a bit more uncomfortable. Yeah, and in truth, I reckon more than half of runners go in the shoe and they don't really even care what it feels like. They just care, care what it looks like. So, <laughs> exactly. Like, I reckon the biggest contribution to shoe sales is the design of the upper. Yeah. In reality. I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. It's only... It's only the discerning runner who is interested in what it feels like and then even less, even more discerning is what it actually does. But you're right, so comfort is the key. And there are studies that have now shown that the comfort initially, and one can define how long is initially, is it the first 20 seconds or is it the first week, is the best predictor of your injury outcome. And so our friend Ben O'Nig has written a paper very recently in 2016 that are more comfortable are associated with lower movement-related injury frequency, right? So comfort reduces injury. And so he ends up proposing a paradigm that he calls the comfort filter paradigm. <laughs> when selecting a running shoe, an athlete selects a comfortable product using his or her own comfort filter. I mean, this is not rocket science. Not very scientist. No. <laughs> this scientific. automatically reduces the injury risk and may be a possible explanation for the fact that there does not seem to have been a trend and injury frequencies over time. So yeah. this you can see why I'm I get frustrated sometimes with this field because 41 years of research progress ends up being just pick what's comfortable <laughs> and you'll be fine. Years of research progress. And that's not always being, true. Like it's not true, is it? Because it, essentially you can walk into a shoe shop no. and as we've you know there's as we've just discussed the idea that cushioning is the thing that's going to make you less injured we we can probably safely say that there is not enough science to support that mm. but that is one of the critical parts when you walk into a shoe shop if there's a lot of cushioning the shoe feels better to run it it feels more comfortable yeah but that is not a definition of comfort is it i mean no so you can deceive people yeah. it reminds me of the the pepsi coke studies where they mm. went around to shopping malls i'm probably going to mess this up i didn't study this pepsi coke stuff somebody I'm will a correct us. sports scientist not a <laughs> nutrition salesperson a uh, soft drink salesperson. But the, the, the theory was that most people prefer Pepsi in taste tests because you have a sip of it. But then when they've got to drink a whole can or a whole 500 ml bottle, it's too sweet. Yeah. So it's good in small doses, not so much in large amounts. And that's the, that's the analogous to what you're saying now is that the soft shoe might be really comfortable for the 30 seconds that you get in the shop. But after 30 minutes of running that softness could actually be affecting you. I've, yeah. I've certainly found that, the, especially with the softer cushioning now, the more cushion shoes hurt my feet because I feel like I'm standing on one of those foam mats at the gym doing stability exercises for half an hour in a run. Um, so, so that's exactly right. So how do people make the call based on comfort is a key thing. It's not just size and how soft it is. So, so if I was doing a study now, that's what I would try and assess. I would... I would try and determine how long it takes. What is the minimum exposure time before people can accurately gauge that a shoe is comfortable? Mm. If I was a shoe company, that would be a really important piece of like, evidence that I'd need because then I would know, do I need to figure out a way to give this person five minutes or do they need five hours? Yeah. Because if, they, if I could, I mean, I don't know how you give them five hours in your shoe before they buy because you'll never... Selling exactly. thing. Yeah. But but that's that seems to me to be the, the key point there, you know. So anyway, back to the studies. There are studies now showing that perceived comfort influences economy. So yeah. we use less oxygen when we think the shoe is comfortable. 
perceived comfort influences what's called planter pressure, or, or in that instance, it's probably the other way around. The planter pressure determines the perceived comfort and so on. Planter, so, just to, to tell us what planter pressure is. Planter is just basically then the underside of your foot, and so right. it's the pressure you feel from the shoe ground onto okay. your foot. That's that bit kind of that runs that muscle that runs underneath the bottom of the foot. Yeah, so you're thinking probably the planter fascia. Planter fascia, fascia that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, that runs that runs from the base of the heel all the way to the front and foot, yeah. and if that gets inflamed, you yeah, missing it's a nasty then you, injury. <laughs> then you're missing a lot of running time. So. Yeah, the, the perceived comfort filter is the logical outcome of all these studies, but it's just so vanilla. The, the perceived comfort again, filter is the logical I don't know. outcome and of the all other these thing studies, is, but it's perceived so comfort vanilla. is not going to be a, a great predictor of injury or not. So if you, if you divided the world into two groups, those who buy the shoe that's comfortable and those who don't, I mean, I don't know why you'd buy the less comfortable shoe. Well, unless it looks good. Uh, yeah. You'll buy a shoe that looks yeah. less good if it's if it looks good and doesn't yeah. feel great. And you walk out of there like limping and hobbling, but you look great. Yeah. Um the 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 group that wears the comfortable shoe probably gets injured fifty percent of the time. Yeah. So you know when your when your predictive value is fifty percent, you might as well offer your dog a choice of two shoes and see which one he fetches for you. you well because well that's, how good, that's how good that's how good it is. And, and so again, for you. We got a comment on Twitter earlier saying the guy's going to wait till the end of this pod to buy his shoe. I'm sorry, we're not helping we're you. Not but, help you. <laughs> but the point is that it still seems like such a lot of guesswork, you know? Yeah. And uh, the reason it's guesswork is because there are so many other factors that probably overwhelm the subtleties of what shoes do. So a shoe might nudge you from high risk to low risk, but if your training is bad, you're getting injured anyway. A shoe might nudge you from... This, this probability to that probability from X to Y, but all the other things that you're doing, the type of training you're doing and that sort of thing, your strength imbalances, nothing in a shoe could ever possibly overcome or compensate for. So in the end, there are probably controllables that cause injury much more than shoes prevent them. So when you say controllables, you mean training regimes, how you train? Yeah, and so that was recognized Again, we go back 41 years to the James paper that introduced us to excessive pronation. It also introduced us to training mistakes. And he said that he'd recognized that 60% of all those injuries he saw were the result of training errors. Too much mileage too right. soon, uh, too many interval training sessions, too much on hills. Subsequently, we've discovered that running on one side of the road with the camber and so forth can cause imbalances and therefore injuries and so on. So... so Training injuries is, and everyone knows this. Yeah. The problem is that people are trying to figure out what shoe do I need to do 90k a week instead of 70. Yeah. So it's all good and well to say, oh, you just got to train less. The guy doesn't want to. Mm. It's not really a viable solution for many people. No. And the shoe, the shoe might change the threshold for injury so that Susan, who's running 50k a week in shoe X, gets injured. But had she been in shoe Y, she might have been okay. That's that's the point, is how do you find that shoe? So the interesting um, aspect of that is then to say, if if we're questioning the, the, the science and the evidence around pronation and shock absorptions, which was what we're doing here, if somebody goes into that shoe shop and we're, we're going to, I think I, I've always said to Rossi, we don't want to necessarily put conjecture out there, but there's always hypotheses that we can reach in these discussions. If somebody's going to go to, uh, into a shoe shop now, what must they look for? What is the best choice in terms of the kind of shoe that they should start with? Let's say they're a first-time runner. If you sent them to a shoe shop, where, what would they? What should they? What questions should they ask? Okay, so there's a couple of research studies worth maybe bringing in here. One is that, and I'm I'm sure you've seen this, probably published it in the magazine, Runners World, right? Is the shape of your shoe determines the shoe you should wear? A uh, shape of your foot. Yeah. determines the shoe, right? So you know this model, is that if you have a high arch, then you are suitable for a neutral shoe. And if you've got a really flat arch, so as if your feet were wet and you stood on a surface and you left what looked like basically yep. a snowshoe. The wet foot test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the wet foot test. Very common. Then you needed a motion control shoe because right. a flat foot was more likely to pronate excessively. Correct. So a guy called Knapnik goes into the military in the US and he's in Air Force, Marine Corps, Army. Now, these are great environments for this study because you're going to get 
a thousand recruits and for six months or a year they're all doing the same thing yeah this is great because the same training the, the same, same look, training yeah. everything's the same and this is really important because the training differences being a key confounder suddenly disappear mm. so he does this and he takes a thousand of these recruits and he puts them in just a neutral shoe without even looking at their feet another thousand he puts in the shoe suitable for the foot yeah based on this arch height test low medium high and then a year later he checks does one group get more injured than the other and he finds no effect so <laughs> this he does this in the air force in i don't know 600 odd people he does in the marine corps in 2000 and the army is two and a half thousand or something yeah and it's a he good finds sample size yeah, it's good, and yeah. and you've got you've got control over what training they do. You, in theory, have got a group of people all similar ages, backgrounds, fitness levels. No effect. The conclusion being that prescribing shoes based on the shape of your foot does not change your risk of injury. Right. Okay. So that's that shoots that one out the water at least. Subsequently, other studies have done similar things where they categorize you as a pronator, supernator, neutral, giving you the shoe that you should be in according to marketing wisdom. Right? Yeah. And again, they find no prediction. There is one study came out last year out of France, I think it was, where they find that if you are a what they classify as an excessive pronator, then you are more successful in motion control. Yeah. So this was a this was a pretty good study. It's a prospective study, so they they don't ask you to think backwards. They they get you in on day zero, and they track you for the next twelve months. And he finds that in that group of people who were excessive pronators, their risk of injury is lower as long as they get the motion control shoe. Whereas if they got neutral, no di no difference. Whereas the neutral runner, it didn't matter. Yeah. So. So, so the only high-risk group is the group that they identified as excessive pronator. And what percentage of the population would be classified as, as overly pronating? Because I, from what we've seen in Runner's World, there, there's a very small proportion, it's a bit like people who supinate. It's a very small proportion of people who would be classified as, as excessive pronators or excessive supinators. That is a very good question, and I have got an answer, but give me 10 but seconds. But it's not exactly, a, it's not a huge number. No, it's a very small yeah. number. The, yeah. it, it, it's, a no, it's like a normal distribution, and by yeah. far the majority of people are in that neutral group. So in other and words, if you, were, I mean, if you were somebody that would sit into that sort of um, space, you could probably go and see a doctor, and a doctor would say, look, you biomechanically are quite um, different in terms of your pronation. I mean, it would be a medical condition that would be an excessive pronator, or would it just be a physiological uh, um, marker it's just a marker so yeah. b because even the definition of excessive pronator is somewhat subjective like define yeah at what point does it become excessive and is it excessive because of the range or is it excessive because of the rate at which it happens so there's a lot of subtleties even in that so that's why that's why it's not really the best test to try and put you in a shoe but if you do fall into this extreme group according at least to this one method then you might be better off having a motion control shoe so i'll tell you the the numbers here exactly is that you're looking this was a study that was done in denmark in 2014 in which they took 927 runners yeah good sample size also good yeah, yeah. and they identified them as either being highly supinated supinated neutral pronated or highly pronated so five yeah. categories and the neutral runners have got 600 right legs so 600 runners yeah so that's two-thirds of runners are in the neutral group right and then supinated is I'm doing this on a sort of flying on the seat of my pants here one-fifth yeah and then that leaves another 10 percent pronation yeah. okay. so it's low so if you walk into a shoe shop so the, it, yeah. the chances are you're not an overpronator. <laughs> so if we're playing the probabilities, yeah. Unless you've got good reason to think otherwise, you're going into a neutral shoe. Yeah. Unless you've and got good we'll reason go with to think Nick's otherwise. comfort filter you're going into and we'll a say that that is the key thing because there's no alternative at this point <laughs> that you get something that's comfortable. But my advice is that you steer clear of extremes. Yeah. Because they're extremes for a reason. Now some people succeed at the extremes which is why there's a market still for barefoot slash minimalist shoes because yeah. one in 20 people thrive without any cushioning at all. 
And to some extent, maybe they've just adapted to those shoes because right. one of the key parts of that minimalist shoe sort of trend was that you couldn't just go from running in a cushion shoe to suddenly running in a pair of Vibram Five Fingers, which were no cushioning at all, because your body was used to running in a certain way. It wasn't going to suddenly adapt. You had to take time to adapt. Is that is that a fair argument? In other words, could you apply that to all levels of shoes? In other words, if you're somebody running in a stability shoe, this is one of the questions I often get at Runner's World. I've been running in stability shoes for X amount of years. You say to me, I need to run in neutral. Should I now change to a neutral shoe? My advice is always to say, stick to what works for you because your body has potentially adapted to that shoe, whatever that shoe is. So as long as you're healthy and able to run injury-free, then you are in adaptation. Okay. If you are injured, then it's a sign that you are not adapting. In fact, there's a definition for injury that involves a, a, a visible or evident failure to adapt. So I reckon just on that, one of the reasons barefoot running was successful for so many people was because they they went to it because they were injured. So the starting point for them was a failure to adapt to normal running in normal shoes. So then they make the switch to barefoot running. But the problem with switching is that if you are, let's say, running four times a week, 40K a week, you cannot do that barefoot straight away. Yeah. It's impossible because after three minutes, your feet are the limiting factor. They burn and force you to walk. And so most people who started barefoot running were forced to change their training in a very conservative direction. And so the guy who was doing 40K a week was suddenly doing 5K a week. Literally, that's all he could do because he would get into his shower at night and his feet would sting. Yeah. And he knew that he couldn't run. He could only run every second day and he could only run for 10 minutes a day before he had to stop. And his injury goes away. Well, what caused this? What solved the problem? Was it being barefoot, or was it the training you did? Yeah, was lower. Was lower. So the the catalyst for the injury was the training, yeah. and being barefoot was a means to an end. Mm. And the end in this instance was training smarter so that you didn't get injured. So the adaptability is the fundamental thing, right? So I'm somewhat laboriously answering your question, but you're asking whether a change is more dangerous than the thing yeah and the answer is yes absolutely that's why when people now take this barefoot running phenomenon for instance and they say the key is not barefoot it's forefoot landing all runners must land on the forefoot that was a stimulus package for physiotherapists again yeah because now all these runners went out there and they said i'm going to land on the forefoot but now how does a runner achieve that the answer is they point their toe while they're running yeah so yeah. they land with a contracted uh, calf muscle. Yeah. And they load their Achilles tendon in their calf and they all end up getting calf strains. Yeah. So the, the, the point is that when you change is dangerous when it comes to injury prevention. Sudden change. Sudden change. Rather than adapting change. Exactly. Because I mean, you, can, you can change if you change slowly. But you have to do it really gradually. And yeah. most people massively underestimate how slowly that has to be. Yeah. That was why Vibram ended up facing a lawsuit is because yeah. they used to sell these shoes with advice <laughs> of how you should build your training up, but they weren't conservative enough. And so it worked for some people, but most people, it was too aggressive and they got injured. Yeah. I got a stress fracture running in them because yeah. I was trying to listen to feedback, but the, the metatarsals in the foot, the feedback wasn't coming quickly enough. And I ended up, it was a stupid training mistake. Yeah. I just did too much on too a much, heavy frame soon. and that was the cause of injury. I'm never going to get a stress fracture in my foot as a result of running in normal shoes unless I run 100k a week, but in barefoot shoes 40k a week did it. Yeah. So okay, so back to our consumer now. Yeah. What does he do at the shoe shop? Let's if he's a novice, if he's a novice and he's got no frame of reference, he buys himself the middle of the range neutral shoe as a start point he's a novice and, and then in future no makes adjustments he based on his experiences. The middle of the right. range so neutral shoe if he buys the middle of the range shoe and finds that it's too soft, the next time he goes in, six months, two years later, he buys the, the flat racing shoe, the lightweight shoe, because it'll have less cushioning, it'll be less soft. If he finds that the shoe is too hard after six months of use, then the next time he goes in, he goes up a step and he gets the shoe with a thicker Based on the comfort Foam. index we've been talking about. Right, but he's allowing himself, you see, he's allowing himself three to six months to get a proper feel of what's comfortable and what's yeah. not. If he buys a shoe and after three months is injured, 
then he's got to ask some serious questions about his training first, <laughs> second, and third. And if he still can't solve the problem there, then the next time he goes and he changes models and he gets something that's a bit stiffer, maybe motion control. The point is, and I hate to, I hate to be uh, cavalier with your money, is that you probably are going to find the best shoe for you after two purchases, not one. Probably yeah. are going to find. And no the best scientist shoe for you is going to give you the formula to get it right. But the best we can do. The, doesn't that not fly in the face of adaptation? Then I mean, if you if you if you're saying you have to try different shoes to suit your body, surely it doesn't matter what shoe you go into. With obviously, you couldn't go into motion control shoe if you were somebody who was perfectly neutral. But within reason. Uh, is it not fair that your body would not just naturally adapt to whatever shoe that you first purchased? And if you train properly and created that adaptation, you would just adapt to whatever shoe that was. It and might, but the problem there is we don't know what train properly means. Yeah. So you're going to train the way you're going to train right. and hope that the shoe facilitates success on that journey. Yeah. Now, again, it comes back to Susan, who's running her 50K a week, uh, and she is either injured or not. And maybe a different shoe would have changed that outcome without changing the training. So you're right. You could say Susan got injured. She should have just been a little bit more conservative. Shouldn't have done that once a week interval session for the first few weeks and so on. Yeah. But this is Captain Hindsight coming into the room now, right? So <laughs> you, have to be, you have to be also a bit pragmatic and say, people are going to make these training errors. Can we find a shoe that best buffers the consequences of them. But it, the, right. the, the point on this is that there's too many moving parts to just simply say it was the shoe, it was the training. Right. So I, I always think the training error is the first, second, and third thing you look at. Because and then that, after that, worry about the shoes. And then after that, you start thinking about, I wonder if I could have done the same training in a different pair of shoes. Then you go back. Now, so, so then hopefully what we can do is we can say that 60% of all first-time shoe buyers get the right shoe because they train smartly, the body adapts, and now they're set for life, right? Right. Until their next training mistake. Yeah. But in the 40% who don't, it's that second purchase where you hope you figure it out. And as long as you're dialed in to your own body's signals – you should be able to figure out what's wrong with the first shoe, you know? Is it too stiff? Is it too flexible? Yeah. Does it provide you? You can feel whether there's support that you need on the inside of the shoe. I've, I've worn shoes where within the first five minutes of running, I feel that I'm actually falling off the shoe inside. I say, okay, this shoe's actually just, there's something wrong with the geometry. Yeah. So next time I'm going to look for something that's a little bit more built up inside. Yeah. As opposed to this. You can feel if it's too soft because your feet will burn. You'll feel like you're standing on a, mm. on a soft mat doing your calf muscle rehab exercises. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can feel when it's too hard. Um, yeah. So, so listen and figure out where you might change things. But, and, and, then, and then to that minority, that one, one in 10, one in 20 who's an excessive pronator, I reckon you're still better off in neutral shoes. Yeah. And then you just see a podiatrist and you get orthotics to if you modulate. Have to. If, if you, you really have to. Yeah. If you're in that minority group, because I don't, yeah. th there's not even any evidence that the motion controlled device in the shoe changes the foot. Yeah. So again, our friend Benner in Canada, they did these unbelievable studies where they put pins in the bone on a because, live person. Yeah. And then made them run. Because the problem with the biomechanics research now is that they stick these reflective markers on your skin or on your shoes. Yes. You've seen, you've seen how they do that. It's the yes. same way they make Lots computer of games. Lots online. Yeah. Yeah. Just look up motion capture, 3D motion yes. capture. You'll find these. It's the same thing they do when they make FIFA PlayStation games and Shrek, right? <laughs> uh, Gollum in Lord of the Rings was a, was a 600 motion capture thing that Andy Serkis <laughs> wore to be Gollum. And wore neutral shoes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he might have been barefoot. He was barefoot. Uh, so, so where was I going with that before we diverged? Um, I was saying, so the, the problem is that those reflective markers move on the skin. And the skin moves in, over the skeleton. And the shoe moves over the body. Right. So whatever you measure as the shoe doing may not necessarily represent what the skeleton is doing. So what did that so, research show? So they stick, the <laughs> they stick pins in the bone and they discover that no matter what shoe you wear, the skeleton moves the same way. And they way. discover that wow. no matter what shoe so you wear, So in actual fact, all the, the motion control devices may not do much anyway. Yeah. 
Um, and in that Which regard, is, oh. yeah, so then now you've really undermined. So we've, we've discovered there's, there's no theoretical basis for motion control and pronation to cause the injury. The motion control devices to solve the non-existent problem don't even work. Yeah. So what are you left with? And shock absorption, again, is also questionable. On the cushioning side. On the cushioning and side. And just a well. last thing, by the way, because now we've given pronation a bad name a little bit. <laughs> Although, well, no, we haven't. We've, we've, we've kind of redeemed it from being the bad guy. Yeah. But this study, um, this Danish study that I mentioned where they put them in five groups, you remember there's highly supinated, supinated, neutral, pronated, highly pronated. What they did there is they work out injuries per 1,000 kilometers. It turns out that the pronation group is lower than the others. Okay. So now this actually is like upside down because all the other studies are saying no link between pronation. The theory says pronation. It's saying better to be a pronator. Yeah. So yeah. the theories are saying pronation causes injury. The Most studies disprove that. This finds that pronation might be protective against injury. And th the problem here is that there are too few of them. There's only 120. Is pronation not then the body's way of shock exactly. absorption? That would be the reason for this. And is so that, that scientifically uh, a fact? Yeah, so what happens when you, when you pronate, and I found the proper definition to redeem myself in the ears of biomechanists is, so pronation is the movement of the ankle joint, around the ankle joint. And the ankle simultaneously everts, which means the foot points out, okay? Foot tilts out, abducts, and dorsiflexes. So there's three biomechanical movements at the same time. In one, no? each foot strike, it does all three of it those things. It does all three of those and things. It rolls forward and in. Rolls forward and inwards mm. and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the strict knows biomechanical yeah. definition. Now... Why does that happen? In part, that happens to dissipate forces because we don't want to land on a rigid system that doesn't allow for any torsion and any rotation and any movement. So a degree of pronation is probably protective. So yeah. again, it comes back to this issue of when is it too much as yeah. opposed to too little as opposed to just right. And because we can't pin it down, it's not worth really worrying about given that most of the research finds it doesn't predict the injury anyway. And as you said right at the start of the podcast, the most amazing uh, device for running is your own body because it, it, it has a lot of the things because of years and years of our development that have allowed us adaption, adaption uh, for running. I mean, we are built to run. That's how we've survived and yeah. ruled and, the world in many ways. And different people do it different mm. ways. Mm. Even at the very elite level where you'd think, and this is one of the things about running, is that there are different ways to achieve near perfection in the same simple task, which yeah. is quite amazing. So when you watch London Marathon and you see Kipchoge running away from, uh, who was he with? It was two Ethiopian fellas whose names I've now gone totally blank on. <laughs> Me too. But, but if, you didn't, if, if you could see silhouettes, you'd be able to tell apart who they are. Yeah. Right? And it's not just because one of them's tall and skinny. They're all skinny dudes. Yeah. So when we when we apply that to the general population some people heel strike some people forefoot strike some people midfoot strike some people heel strike with pronation other people heel strike with less yeah none of those things is necessarily bad and none of them is necessarily good when you change them it's probably bad yeah so when you try and tell a heel striker to change that you introduce a risk that they probably could have done without yeah now Irene Davis whose name came up earlier, she's done what they call gait retraining studies to treat injuries. So she reckons that heel striking, high loading rates is a predictor of tibial stress injuries, like we said, stress fractures in your shins. And she reckons that over time you can change the way people land to reduce that risk. No problems. Because they, they needed to change because they had stress fractures. Yeah. But when you start applying that same logic to people who are not injured, then you actually just yeah. You're only You're potentially making risk. them injured. Like, where's the benefit there? You know, there's mm. none. So, so we, yeah. So, a system that works is best left alone, and a system that is injured is best left analyzed properly with an understanding of what we've been talking about, and with the aim of making small changes, not drastic ones. So, a final word, um, and this I'm going to throw your hypothesis cap on here. Looking at the last. 40 years of shoe technology and the way it's developed and it has developed in many different ways. It is a almost impossible um, sort of thing to drill down and give a definitive answer. Where do you think shoe technology can go 
And do you think this kind of issue around what is the right shoe shoe for you can be can it be can it be solved? Because I know that there is things like three D printing now, and New Balance have been doing that with some of their shoes, where you can three D print your inner sole for your particular shoe. And there's talk about creating more neuromuscular feedback through insoles in your shoe. There was even a shoe that claimed you could <laughs> you could lose weight if you ran in that particular shoe. They were sued for that, by the way. But an interesting, do you think it is? Do you think shoe technology is there's going to be a, a, a definitive answer to the right shoe to buy for you, or is it always going to be a case of experimentation? I think big data and IT technology and different methods of analyzing these complex systems might shed some light on how different things interact. Because one of the problems in the past, until very recently, is that when you measure someone in a biomechanics lab, you're doing, you're analyzing variables independent of one another. So I'm looking at the ankle. What is, that? what is the ankle doing? And then I'm looking at the knee. And then I'm looking at the hip. And sometimes you'll get people combine all of those into one outcome, leg stiffness, for instance. But it's very difficult to do this complex system analysis, what has been up to fairly recently. So I reckon in the future there'll be better studies of 5,000 people looking at how all these complex biomechanical variables are integrated into one system which then maybe improves our predictive value from i don't know what it is 52 percent which is only marginally better than your dog fetching your slippers <laughs> to 65 percent i don't know maybe yeah but i reckon the comfort thing is the, the the most obvious way to sell the shoes so shoes will figure out ways to be more comfortable can they be much more comfortable yeah i don't really think so and then the other thing is they'll they'll sell more on performance um yeah. And so already at the elite level, with and we won't even get into that, but the the next sub two attempt was announced a week and a half, two weeks ago. That will be that will be the trigger to talk about whether shoes can actually boost performance by meaningful amounts. But that's how shoes will be sold. But the mm. you know we're we're selling the same shoe now in 2019 that we were selling in about 19. 19- 78. Yeah. You know, we're, we're selling the same shoe. And then in the 80s, in it got bigger and we softer and more cushioned with motion control. We then phased that out. We went barefoot and now we're back in the 80s. <laughs> so if, if by, 20, by 2042, maybe we'll be running in slippers. And then by 2052, we'll be running in Spice Girl shoes. I don't know. Like, but whatever it is, the notion that a shoe can prevent an injury is flawed. So stick to comfortable and what works. The so final conclusion, the science doesn't support the fact that pronation so and, and, and cushioning and does make a shoe better or worse. And potentially the best advice, as you just said, go for the comfort factor. That's the important bit. And actually, maybe even find the shoe that looks good because if you feel like you look good in your pair of shoes, that even in a way, it sounds a bit glib to say that, but in a way, if you feel good in your shoes, you're probably going to be happy with them as well. Unless you feel so good that you think you should run faster than you should and then you get more likely, then you'll be more likely to be injured. But... Yeah, the uh, the answer is that it depends, as we've discovered. <laughs> it always over ends an, with that conclusion. Over an, hour, over an hour and a half. I hope that we haven't been aggressively sitting on the fence in this discussion. Like, I hate when people do that and you listen for an hour and a half and you're left thinking, well, what should I do? I hope we've given people a firm... Yeah. template to go in there and make some decisions based on? Well, we've always based this on science, and I think a lot of the research that you've done building up to this podcast has brought us, you know, we, we've got, we, we can only base it on the research that we have, and uh, that research is, is what we're suggesting. We're not making uh, big leaps of faith here. We're talking about the research that's come out in many ways. Yeah, and hopefully that puts people in shoes within, within two purchases that they can then be comfortable with and then stick with. You know what else? To, just We didn't even bring this up. It doesn't help is that the shoes change the models, the brands change the models. It's the worst thing ever. So like, then you find, okay, Why? I'm going to stay in this shoe, and then two years later they discontinue that shoe, yeah. and they rename it with subtle modifications, and now you're actually back at square one. So yeah. without wanting everyone to go away and become like a techie, or a, what do they call it? A <laughs> geek? A geek, <laughs> a running shoe geek. When you find the shoe that works for you, like try and understand what pairs. it is. Well, there's that, yeah. And understand what it is so that when that shoe is replaced, you're more likely to get the right one of its uh, yeah. successor. My personal bugbear. 
Professor Ross Tucker, many thanks for your time. Uh, we have answered some of your questions around uh, shoe technology. Is it good science or just good marketing? And good luck with your next purchase. I hope that some of you that have uh, engaged with us on our Twitter feed, Sports SciPod is our Twitter feed account. And you can also catch us on Science of Sport on Facebook as well, which is Ross's account. Um, don't forget to interact. Let us know what you think. If you have any questions, we will be talking about the performance of shoes. Uh, Ross alluded to that a few moments ago around uh, the sub two hour attempt and how shoes can potentially make you fast. We'll look into that at a further podcast. But for now, many thanks and uh, speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Science of Sport podcast. Follow us on Twitter at SportsSciPod and on Instagram at Science of Sport Podcast.